Thank you, Allison. And so happy that everyone could join to have this really timely and important discussions about our beloved grasslands and how we can create new tools and scale those tools to meet the tremendous demand and urgency of the moment. Uh, what I'm going to be focusing on today was a idea that began with an Audubon and in partnership uh, with the Missouri Department of Conservation more than eight years ago with uh, then leader of our uh, Prairie Bird Initiative, uh, Justin Pepper, uh, Max Alliger of the Missouri Department of Conservation, and Roger Steele uh, on staff uh, uh, with Audubon as well. And really the idea around this, uh, what has become known as the Audubon Conservation Ranching Initiative, our certification, is building a supply chain that uh, both serves as a means to increase uh, management outcomes on the ground for grassland birds and other associated wildlife and ecosystem services, as well as creating a renewed or resurgent connection between those elements and consumers. Uh, there are 48 million birders, uh, self-identifying birders in the country, and how can we create that linkage that can scale uh, increase outcomes and profitability for ranchers and the grasslands that they steward. Um, and kind of to visualize that the conservation, uh, the Audubon certification connects conscientious consumers uh, to ranches where bird friendly management, regenerative management is supporting grassland bird conservation. That's the program in a nutshell. Uh, eight years ago, it seemed like the third rail of conservation um, and maybe a daunting challenge. And we've come a long way since then. Uh, really wanting to focus this program in the areas with the most grassland bird uh, abundancy uh, and to, to really have a impact on uh, these species. And also, as we know, this is an area that uh, we've lost nearly half or a little more than half of this, uh, which was once the most abundant North American native ecosystem. And so knowing that we want to protect it, but we have to have it on the landscape to protect it, we need solutions that tap into um, new areas to drive this conservation. And we have to do so in a multitude of, of areas within the grassland ecosystem, because our birds are so dynamic, our solutions and tools have to be every bit as dynamic as the birds that spend half their life in the northern reaches of this ecosystem and the other half of their lives in other parts of the ecosystem, uh, south and in, in the southern part of the United States and Central and South America. Over the last five years, we've scaled this program to more than uh, 2.3 million acres under management through the enrollment of more than 93 family uh, farms and ranches, uh, which shows the ability to scale by using the market and the premium market, uh, grass-fed, pasture-raised market as a driver um, of those outcomes. Uh, the Audubon products raised on Audubon bird-friendly land uh, are available at 140 points of purchase uh, throughout America and available now at uh, every uh, home in the lower 48. Um, when we look at bird-friendly production, we really look at it uh, holistically through this program. Uh, that's, of course, the habitat management plans that are developed, but that's also reducing uh, chemicals and harmful pesticides that also contribute to grassland bird loss through the uh, uh, degrading of the food chain that supports uh, grassland bird uh, reproduction. And you, you will see the Audubon seal here, but I want to make a special note that uh, we've reached this point uh, due to the great partnerships that we have, and I could have five or six slides that uh, point to those partners such as Thugpa, the Thunder Basin, Grasslands Prairie Ecosystem Association, Missouri Department of Conservation, Pheasants Forever, 
who helps to deliver this program and so many others. And I, I really thank them. Uh, we're, we lead this program, but it's with our partners such as Burr Conservancy of, Ro of the Rockies and, and so many other partners that have helped us scale this initiative. Um, to make a market-based certification work, at the heart of it uh, is the benefit to the rancher. And what we've now developed around our market ecosystem is kind of a four-pronged approach to providing the, that incentive payment. This program boils down to, and this idea, this concept boils down to in premium uh, uh, payments for products as premium payments for uh, conservation activities on the ground. And we're starting to see this emerging uh, uh, beneficial uh, cycle that's taking place within our, our market ecosystem. We look at this again as being a certification that starts with improving outcomes for birds uh, and for the grassland ecosystem, has the credibility by being audited by a third party, uh, and we're proving out or monitoring the results of this initiative through the uh, bird monitoring that we do on the ground using B uh, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies IMBCR protocol or an equivalent protocol to uh, monitor the bird outcomes. We filter that through what we call our bird friendliness index, uh, which is showing over the time of, of this program being on the ground, we're starting to move the needle for birds and bird conservation on enrolled ranches when compared to non-enrolled ranches. And, and that's at the heart of the program. It's at the heart of what we're communicating uh, to our members and to general consumers. And you know what I wanna really uh, point out here is uh, what was always promising about uh, market-based conservation is the efficiency of market-based conservation. Uh, this program is delivered at roughly 95 cents an acre. That includes the bird monitoring, the technical assistance, and the verification process, as, as well as the marketing support that we provide uh, behind the certification. Uh, when you compare, we took a snapshot. Again, this is not to replace or uh, better than, but when you really take a look at how we do grasslands conservation, I think the promise and the premise behind uh, this initiative and this approach to conservation really favors well when adding, how do we add more acres under management? Comparing that to some of our traditional tools, it's an it's a efficient way to do so. Um, and again, at the heart of this is a premise that bird lovers, uh, starting with Audubon members and our partner members and uh, will respond. Uh, so far, uh, as we began this marketing campaign to our membership, uh, they're responding very favorably. Uh, we have 1.7 million members uh, at the National Audubon Society and a broader six and a half million members nationwide amongst the bird conservation organizations. And if we can continue to mimic this type of conversion rate, when we market this program to our members, uh, they convert at nearly a 16% rate, which is far outpacing the national average. In a nutshell, uh, this program has scaled uh, probably even beyond our wildest imagination initially, and it's really speaking to the benefits of holistic uh, management and holistic approaches to conservation and tagging those approaches to the broader consumers and raising their awareness. Um, that's in a nutshell how this partnership has approached scaling conservation outcomes through the marketplace, in particular the niche uh, grass-fed pasture-raised marketplace. Um, and it sh shows that you don't need a huge uh, market share to cre create huge outcomes for birds on the ground. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Um, I'm excited to be here today and, and really share this with, with everyone and excited about the opportunity to scale up the impact of our work to secure the future that we all want for land and people. 
And we all know the, the scale of our grasslands or grazing lands in the United States. And we know how vital they are to, to a whole bunch of outcomes for nature, uh, for people. Um, but it is a, in addition to being a huge kind of ecological system, it is also a huge uh, foundation for our grazing-based enterprises in this country, and in particular for beef cattle, uh, where we have 93 million animals in the United States, um, and over 750,000 people or families engaged in ranching-based enterprises. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows this, but there are about 775 million acres of grazing lands in the United States. That is the largest single land use, and it is vital uh, to protect these lands um, and make them more valuable to people so that they can remain valuable to nature um, in ways that, that I think we are all keenly aware. And the Nature Conservancy is working on this uh, under uh, our North America Agriculture Program, uh, which has two main uh, focal areas. One is sustainable grazing land, where I'll focus my talk today. Uh, the other is around soil health and nutrients, which applies primarily on cropland. Not all of the lands, we have four key goals, and it's to protect habitat, restore degraded land, uh, to advance climate smart agriculture, and to secure fresh water. And within each of those goals, which of course are also interrelated, meaning that if you work on one, you often drive outcomes in another category or goal set, uh, we have a, a core set of interrelated strategy components. And, and I'll focus on them a little bit more as we go through here, but we've got to better tap into and leverage the uh, beef supply chain uh, if we want to succeed. It's, it is the dominant land use, and it's the people who are raising livestock who are the stewards of our land and, and who um, we need to rely on for the future. Uh, along with that, uh, we do need science, policy, and business model innovation and advancement. And of course, we need to identify, prove out, and increase the use of good management practices. We've come so far in regard to that over the last decades, uh, but we need to go farther. Overall, for the Nature Conservancy on grazing lands, by 2025, we are seeking to improve the management of 240 million acres of grazing lands in the United States. That's about a third of our total. We hope to do this by building on our farm and ranch holdings across the United States, in addition to the many conservation easements and relationships with farmers and ranchers that we have, we uh, own about 378 properties. Um, and of that, about 480,000 acres is grazing land that we actively manage to advance outcomes for nature, uh, but also to produce food and benefit our ranching partners. So to do this, um, I referred to some of our strategies before, but we've got to tap into the supply chain more effectively with sourcing programs, industry standards, transparency, and producer leadership. We need to uh, collaborate better as civil society with research, uh, demonstration, piloting, making the case for sustainability for improved outcomes for people in nature, and of course, innovation. We've got to be a laboratory. And then finally, we need to set a context that is supportive of people and organizations doing this work. We do need to increase federal funding. We probably need to spend more. We need to use technical assistance in a variety of ways. And we need to enhance our public lands policy to enable producers to adopt and apply innovative and effective practices. More specifically, the Nature Conservancy involved in our partnership to support each of strategies. First, the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. This is an initiative that I hope I can raise awareness for in the rest of my presentation today. I'll focus on a little bit more uh, in a few slides. In addition to the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, the Nature Conservancy is also working directly with individual retail companies, packers and processors, and producers to identify 
the, the practices, the programs that we need and to help get them on the ground in an effective way. Finally, again, uh, federal agencies, academic and other NGO partners, uh, indigenous people and organizations, as well as state, local and regional uh, partners, um, both alliances and government agencies are vital to this work. As I mentioned, I want to talk a little bit more now about the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. This organization is working really hard, uh, and TNC is a founding member, so I can vouch for that, to advance, support, communicate, continuous improvement of sustainability across the entire U.S. beef value chain. That's from ranches to feeding operations to packers and processors and retailers and on to consumers. And our goal in doing that is to make the U.S. beef value chain the trusted global leader in environmentally sound, socially responsible, and economically viable beef. Here's a snapshot of the members. There are about 120 members of the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, again, representing all of those sectors. And you can see from this slide that the core of the U.S. conventional beef industry is involved in the U.S. Roundtable and working really hard to advance its mission and vision. So here's a little bit of the history. The organization has been around since about 2015 when it was founded with 94 members. And today it has worked through a set of stakeholder-based processes to launch a U.S. beef sustainability framework. And that framework includes high priority indicators for sustainability. It includes metrics that are sector specific, so that would apply to a cow-calf producer or a retailer that also relate back to those indicators and a set of assessment guides, really guidance for actors in each beef sector to advance improved outcomes under those indicators. It was published in 2019. And so I'll just take a, a few minutes here to go into a little bit more detail about what that framework entails. Um, but I encourage you all to visit www.usrsb.org and take some time to go through it. It's an extensive document that I think does provide uh, an important element of a roadmap to a better future for our grazing land. To dive in a little bit, the high priority sustainability indicators for the US RSB uh, kind of include, I think, what we would all agree are the most important aspects of sustainability on our grazing lands. Water resources, land resources, air and greenhouse gases, efficiency and yield, a measure of business effectiveness, employee safety and well-being, and animal health and well-being. A quick note here on land resources, because I want to make sure that this comes through loud and clear, is that for the round table, the land resources indicator is based on the stewardship of terrestrial and aquatic habitat in relation to water, soil, and biodiversity in an area. The, the establishment of that definition for land resources by the round table, I think, was really important. The, the industry for many years has articulated um, real concern, care, and a history of stewardship for our natural resources. But this is a public statement that it is vital to the future of the industry. I think set a new benchmark for commitment and eventually transparency around what the industry is doing to protect our land resources. Similarly, for water resources and to address air and greenhouse gas challenges. For the cow-calf sector, uh, the metrics that relate to each of those indicators um, are defined in the following way. And I broke them out here a little bit. The, the items in the blue box uh, really relate, I think, to, to what many of us are coming to the summit to dig into in more detail. Uh, water resources, land resources, air and greenhouse gas emissions. But those things, if we want to succeed over time, have to be considered on a co-equal basis with the business, the animals, the livestock involved, and the people who work on and make their living on our grazing operation. And so these things, um, critical for the cow-calf sector, they're different, of course, for the other sectors, the feeding, packing, and processing, and retail sectors. 
Uh, but I think there's a common element here that is really relevant and something to think about as we chart a roadmap in this summit, which is that grazing management planning or improving grazing and ranch management um, is the central feature of the water resource, land resource, and air and greenhouse gas metrics for the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. It's about improving the condition uh, and the outcomes of our grazing lands in ways that benefit nature and in ways that benefit people. And I think that is a great complement to a lot of the other topics that we're going to be discussing. I hope we can make more of that. So going forward with U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, this year the organization is working really hard to develop uh, targets to develop goals for the entire supply chain or value chain and establish sector-based targets, again, for cow-calf, feeders, packers and processors, and retailers of beef. Going forward, the roundtable will launch into an intensive effort to build awareness and to promote adoption of the U.S. beef industry's sustainability framework and to bring more resources to it to support everyone from the rancher through the retailer to continuously improve their operations and make a difference for people and nature going forward. In conclusion, the Nature Conservancy is committed to a beef industry and, and, is, and the role it will play in protecting and restoring grazing land. This is vital to biodiversity, water resource protection, it's vital to providing the food that we all, millions of Americans and millions more around the world rely on, as well as the stable livelihoods and good life ways for the people who produce the beef. We need to enhance supply chain resilience. As part of this, we've all seen how disrupted the supply chain is recently. And we need to find ways, of course, to address deep greenhouse gas emissions in all of this work. Clearly, the pathway to success here is with collaboration, and it's got to start by empowering ranchers and farmers who are the stewards of our lands and waters to put it on the ground in the first place. Really appreciate everyone's time and attention, and we will hold uh, questions and discussion um, until the, the end of this session. Um, but I really look forward to hearing feedback from everyone and, and exploring how we can better integrate this work with U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef and other in initiatives into a grander uh, roadmap for our central grasslands. Thank you. Hola, buenas tardes. Quiero agradecer al comité organizador de la cumbre de la hoja de ruta de los pastizales centrales 2020 por la distinción de haberme invitado a participar como ponente en este trascendente evento. A continuación voy a presentar algunas ideas e iniciativas que se están llevando a cabo en México para transitar hacia una ganadería sustentable y por lo tanto a la conservación de pastizales y de otros ecosistemas usados en la actividad ganadera. Son actividades que estamos emprendiendo desde hace algunos años. Ha sido una tarea difícil, pero vamos paso a paso. México es un país ganadero. El 56% de su superficie en 1.2 millones de ranchos ganaderos se dedican a la cría de ganado en condiciones de pastoreo. Se cuenta con un inventario de 32.4 millones de cabezas de ganado bovino. En 2019, México ocupó el onceavo lugar a nivel mundial en la producción agropecuaria y en 2018 el sexto lugar en la producción de carne de bovino. Sin embargo, es necesario considerar el impacto ambiental de la ganadería convencional por todos nosotros es conocido. En México, esta actividad contribuye con el 10% del total de emisiones de gases de efecto de invernadero, junto con la agricultura, el crecimiento urbano y el industrial, ha ocasionado la pérdida del 47% de los pastales nativos, la fragmentación del hábitat. 
y ha sido la causa de la desaparición de especies que ha mermado la población de cada toro. La deforestación sobre pastoreo y el mal manejo de los potreros ha ocasionado el 61% de los suelos de México. Perdón. Disculpen, se ve. No worries, we'll, we can take a second to, to figure out. We do have backup um, if we want Alejandro to, to share from his screen, I think. There we go. Disculpen. Looks like we're headed there, yep. Thank you so much. Una disculpa. Excellent, thank you, appreciate it. ¿Cómo la ganadería extensiva puede contribuir en el futuro de los pastizales? La opción más viable, pues, es producir conservando. El desafío más grande que incrementa la humanidad es incrementar la producción de alimentos de manera sustentable ante escenarios inciertos de cambio climático y de tipo económico. Los recursos disponibles para esta para este fin cada día son más escasos, por lo que la organización, coordinación y cooperación entre dependencias gubernamentales, productores organizados, iniciativa privada, las organizaciones no gubernamentales, las instituciones de investigación y enseñanza han sido la clave para contribuir en el avance de la seguridad alimentaria y la conservación del patrimonio natural de México. Un ejemplo de esto son los aliados que se tienen en el proyecto Biopasos trabajando en el estado de Chiapas. Un ejemplo de organización, coordinación y cooperación es la Mesa Redonda de la Ganadería Sustentable en México. Objeto social y misión es contribuir a la sustentabilidad de toda la cadena de valor pecuaria de México, considerando aspectos sociales, ambientales y económicos, a través de la cooperación de los mismos actores que participan. Actualmente está en proceso su constitución legal y su integración en la Mesa Global de Ganadería, Susten de Ganadería Sustentable. Es necesario contar con instrumentos de política pública que permitan llevar a cabo la producción de alimentos de origen animal de una, de, de una manera conjunta con la conservación y aprovechamiento sustentable de los pastizales, contribuir en la lucha contra el cambio climático y a mejorar el marco institucional y político. Por lo anterior, se está elaborando el documento de acciones de mitigación nacionalmente apropiadas, NAMA, eh, para la ganadería en, eh, sustentable en condiciones de pastoreo, para la búsqueda de su financiamiento. Esta NAMA busca avanzar hacia una ganadería baja en carbono, a mejorar la competitividad y productividad del sector ganadero. Y mismo a la adaptación a cambio climático, incrementar la captura de carbono y, el, y su almacenamiento en los suelos, 
la conservación y aprovechamiento sustentable de la biodiversidad. Esto mediante la implementación de prácticas sustentables de producción en donde el manejo de la tierra y del ganado es bajo eh, esquemas naturales, con una visión holística. Pues esto se hace pues, para reducir los conflictos entre sectores, aumentar las sinergias y, la, y las complementariedades de ellas, entre estas actividades económicas y la conservación de la flora y fauna. Es necesario contar con herramientas para la planeación y la toma de decisiones, como, les, como es el caso del Atlas Nacional de Vulnerabilidad al Cambio Climático que está llevando a cabo el Instituto Nacional de Ecología y Cambio Climático en México. Actualmente se está construyendo el Inventario Nacional de la Biodiversidad de las Tierras de Uso Ganadero y se están buscando apoyos para llevar a cabo el diagnóstico nacional de la condición actual de los agostaderos y su tendencia. En esta diapositiva se presenta eh, la información que es posible obtener en los mapas de vulnerabilidad de, eh, de la ganadería extensiva al cambio climático, en especial al estrés hídrico y a las inundaciones, donde se aporta información referente a la exposición, a la sensibilidad de los ecosistemas y de los sistemas de producción pecuaria y la capacidad adaptativa que se tienen a nivel municipal. La investigación, transferencia e innovación tecnológica a los productores se está llevando a cabo a través de proyectos integrales de ganadería sustentable en donde participan todos los actores de la cadena de producción que eh, eh, presenté en diapositivas anteriores. Todas estas actividades que se están llevando a cabo son con financiamiento internacional. Un caso de ello es el proyecto Biopasos, que es el proyecto que busca mejorar y rescatar la biodiversidad a través de paisajes ganaderos silvopastoriles. El objetivo es promover enfoques agrosilvopastoriles climáticamente inteligentes y amigables con la biodiversidad. Se está llevando a cabo en tres entidades federativas. Son eh, entidades que son consideradas dentro del proyecto Red Más, de reducción de emisiones por deforestación y degradación de la tierra. El proyecto ha permitido la capacitación de 1.232 productores e impactado en 35.000 hectáreas del trópico mexicano. También cabe hacer mención que existen y se están promoviendo en su etapa inicial otros proyectos como el proyecto Conecta que está a cargo del Instituto Nacional de Ecología del Cambio Climático y donde estamos participando de ellos de manera coordinada. Este proyecto busca mejorar la salud de, la, de las cuencas junto con la producción ganadera y agroforestal. También se están llevando a cabo en el estado de Tabasco, también de las zonas tropicales, el proyecto de ganadería sustentable en el marco de la estrategia Red Más Tabasco. Otras acciones que pueden contribuir al desarrollo de la ganadería sustentable y por lo tanto a la conservación de los pastizales y de otros ecosistemas es el diseño de esquemas de financiamiento mixto atractivo a los productores, el desarrollo de mercados alternativos para la producción sustentable, la diversificación productiva de la ganadería extensiva y el pago de servicios ambientales a los ganaderos los servicios ecosistémicos que se están produciendo en sus tierras y que no han sido hasta el momento valorados. Estos factores que acabo de mencionar van a permitir consolidar los esfuerzos, ya que no es posible conservar lo que no es valorado. Muchas gracias por su atención. Gracias.
Tonka Fund is a relatively new um, organization, um, but it's been in the works for many, many years. Um, many of you may have heard of Tonka Bar or Native American Natural Foods, which has developed a meat product um, snack bar. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to check out um, Tonka Bar. Um, and so we are the nonprofit 501c3 um, piece of that that was just developed just recently. Back up a slide here. Um, in the last year, we just um, got our fiscal offers fiscal sponsorship. So we're very new, but the idea here has been um, in the works for quite some time since Tonka Bar was actually in the works. And I'll explain that a little bit more um, a little bit later on uh, in the slide presentation. Um, so one of the things that we, we express at Tonka Bar is where we've been. Uh, we understand the evolution of the Great Plains um, was part of the geology, a climate, grazing animals, and disturbances, and predators. And for most of you on there, I'm sure that you probably are aware of all that. But the big focus was the grazing animals and what they did to the landscape and also the predators or the humans that were also on the landscape with the bison and who relied heavily in the, in the Northern Plains or across the, uh, this region of um, the North America. And so we had a lot of moving, grazing, wallowing buffalo um, over 200 years ago, 150 to 200 years ago. This was what we were looking at on the landscape. And native people of this region, of the Great Plains particularly, but all across North America, relied heavily upon the resources of these animals. And so um, many of you may know all about the, the loss of these animals as well. Um, within a matter of a few decades to control the, the native populations, um, 30 to 60 million bison or buffalo were gone. I'll, I'll use buffalo and bison interchangeably, um, but meaning the same thing. Um, so many of you may have seen these pictures before of what the commissary of what the, the native people lost in the region and the effects of that it had upon the grasslands. When you start taking fire away, when you start taking a large grazing animal away, replacing it with a foreign animal that you can mimic some of the grazing pieces with, but uh, it has a great um, uh, disturbance on the landscape in terms of um, monoculture and the fencing that was put up and things like that. So that's kind of the history that really the deep history of where Tonka Fun is, was born out of. So with the loss of the, the bison, basically the tribal nations that relied particular heavily upon them lost their commissary. Um, I borrowed the traditional uses of buffalo from the Intertribal Buffalo Council, who mainly works with the tribal um, entities that are in the process of um, reintroducing bison and have been in the, they have been in existence for about, um, oh, I think around 35 years now. Um, but there was something that uh, Tonka Bar and Tonka Fund were, and why Tonka Fund was, um, uh, decided upon is that there was a lack of information going to tribal producers. Uh, many of you that have been across the Great Plains knows that many of the reservations in that area rely heavily upon grazing cattle and there are very few um, bison that have been reintroduced except in some of the tribal herds. And so we've also felt that there was a lack of information being provided and a lack of assistance to individual uh, native producers and to the families that wanted to get back into the bison production. So another reason why Tonka Fund was um, envisioned. So this is our vision statement um, and what, what we were looking to try to do. Empowering Native American ranchers to restore the economy that centers around Buffalo. Uh, we're looking at doing capacity building, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. We are also in the business of trying to re-grant funding. Um, we're primary right now, Tonka Fund is funded through some generous grants, through some other foundations, but we are also doing fundraising and, and relying upon donations. And we're trying to get as much of that money back into the hands of tribal native producers. Um, and we say Great Plains, but we are willing to work with just about anybody. Um, 
uh, that is on tribal lands or tribal producers that would like to reintroduce bison. Uh, some of the things that we, in our mission statement is securing capital. Where maybe some of the tribes, the tribal programs, there's money available through the tribal entities, through Intertribal Buffalo Council, but we're finding that most of our native producers do not have um, the ability to get the capital needed to reintroduce bison. And then we're also looking to provide that training and technical assistance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were uh, the nonprofit arm of the Tonka family of the Tonka Bar, or Native American Natural Foods. And one of the things that why we were also um, created was Native American Natural Foods um, that, that process the Tonka Bar um, only use, can only find less than 10% of their animals that they use to process for the meat bar uh, that is primarily bison and rice is um, they, are, they can't find the animals that, um, to buy from native producers because they're just not there. So that's another reason why Tonka um, Fund was envisioned. Um, there's just a picture of Tonka bars. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's the buffalo meat with cranberries. Um, and, but we also realized too, along with trying to help uh, native producers bringing bison back into the, to the environment is not only um, trying to get them there, but having those producers be sustainable. And that's what we're looking at marketing plans, local foods and business planning for them. And we're also very committed to looking at the ecological sustainability, which is the grassland management. Um, as I mentioned early in the earlier slides, um, you know, how that the whole ecosystem evolved was with grazing and with large herbivores, large grazing animals. And that is a lot of places missing and how, how they moved around and how they were uh, ad were adapted to the grassland environment. Um, we also are looking at somewhat at the, the cultural and spiritual pieces as well. Um, we are looking at working with some of the elders from the different tribes to capture some of the information that is rapidly being lost. Um, some of the things, particularly in the ecological areas of, of how tribes um, uh, 150 to 200 years ago actually were great land managers. They moved, their, their commissary moved, and um, we we're trying to look at some funding for getting some of those stories told. Um, with all of that, we're hoping the physical well being of the land and the animals um, would, could be sustainable. Um, it's, a, it's a large task, but we're fairly new. So some of the things that we're looking at for possibly funding is to help native producers get their land management and their, that piece um, figured out. And every tribe and every reservation is just a little bit different. Um, so we're trying to help producers, empower producers to be able to look to their tribal governments to figure that out. Um, one of the bigger things that's a little bit more easier is, you know, fundraising for infrastructure pieces like fencing and equipment and doing some sharing of some of the equipment that's needed to, to move animals around and to um, manage animals. Uh, one of the things we're looking to is getting back on the buffalo, um, is getting buffalo back on the land and working with national parks and things like that. Technical advice and research is also a piece of what we're looking to do, which would also increase the grazing, the grazing piece. And um, also to see what's going on. Please, sorry. Um, technical advice and research and business planning. Also, we're looking at the investments and fundraising um, part of that. And we're looking at some of the larger companies. Tonka Bar is actually working with uh, production pieces of the Nyman Farms um, to also uh, collaborate with um, and some of the grass-fed beef that they look at. So there's a lot of different pieces that we're trying to put together. Uh, like I said, we're fairly new. We're only a little over a year old, um, but we're excited to collaborate with some of the other pieces, um, other foundations, other organizations to make some of these things happen. Um, and with that, I'll just leave you with my email um, information and any questions, please feel free to let me know. Thank you.
Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for um, the opportunity to be part of this panel and, and all these really exciting examples of ways that people are working at scale. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about some collaborations for impact at the scale of nature. WWF is a global organization that's committed to a future in which people live in harmony with nature. We're active in 100 countries around the world. And here in, in North America, we've been committed to the conservation of the Northern Great Plains for almost two decades. Our Northern Great Plains program works across five states and two provinces. And our vision is a future in which thriving prairies and abundant wildlife contribute to the cultural and economic sustainability of the people who live here. Our goals are to sustain intact grasslands and enhance biodiversity and to restore two flagship species, the bison and the black-footed ferret. We do this by partnering with local communities and driving for incentives and in markets and policy that result in a better future. I've been in this role for a little over a decade and I, I'm, I've got to say I'm particularly optimistic at this at, um, time and excited about the future. We're seeing new recognition of the importance of grasslands as working lands and important to mitigating climate change, supporting livelihoods and culture of rural and indigenous people and saving declining species. We're seeing a new level of interest from companies, from government, from the foundations who want to invest in the future of grasslands. So what I wanna to talk to you today is about um, three different collaborations for grasslands and wildlife conservation at multiple scale with uncommon partners. WDF is a part of all three of these collaborations. Um, they, uh, we are either helping to lead or supporting uh, these collaborations. So the one is at the global scale, um, the second is, a, is with Native Nations in the Northern Plains, and the third is at the scale of the Great Plains. So I'm going to hit all three at a pretty high level because uh, it's a lot to cover in, in a short time, but I thought they were great examples of large-scale cross-collaboration that have an opportunity to coalesce and um, with this initiative and, and build something even bigger. So this is a map of, global, of grasslands globally, and the red triangles are where WWF has offices working on grassland conservation. Uh, in 2019, we started the Global Grasslands and Savannas Initiative, a new initiative to elevate the grasslands and savannas biome and to strengthen efforts to conserve them. There are two main work streams with this initiative. One is to ele elevate the profile of grasslands and savannas to the highest levels of international attention, ensuring they get the investment they deserve, and second, to deliver on their ground interventions. I want to focus just on the first one because um, I think everyone's aware and we've talked about the fact that grasslands haven't been at elevated in the global conservation um, agenda. And given that this is 2020 and um, targets are being set, and resources will be devoted um, over for the coming decade of conservation. It's our goal to um, bring people together and launch a global coalition with strategic partners to develop consensus, set objectives, convene influencers, advocate globally, and share information and best management practices. Um, we want to see a, a global monitoring system to track and disseminate information about conversion rates, biodiversity, and carbon storage much like what's already been done for forests, and um, to incorporate grasslands and savannas and sustainability commitments in the private sector. So we wanna influence global funding mechanisms towards grasslands and savannas, and lastly, engage producers and consumers to increase the supply and demand for products that value the biodiversity of grasslands and savannas. And I think we've heard two great examples already this morning from Audubon and from Tonka Bar of very specific efforts to do that. Oh, let me, sorry. Um, one last thing I wanted to say is this um, platform launched this week. The very first meeting happened Tuesday morning. There will be monthly calls. If anybody who's participating in this has an interest in, part in joining and participating and contributing and learning about this um, effort, you are more than welcome and we'd love to have you. The second initiative I want to touch on, and this is, this is supported, not, not led by WWF, is a regional sustainable financing initiative for tribal wildlife conservation in the Northern Great Plains. 
There are 15 native nations in the Northern Great Plains, at least 10 million acres of tribal trust and tribally old land, owned lands, not only including, but not including lands owned by individual citizens of native nations. Tribal wildlife departments in general lack funding to develop and expand essential initiatives that will allow them to drive the recovery and maintenance of ecosystem health. For example, many native nations lack sufficient funding to hire a, a single wildlife biologist or provide adequate facilities and equipment for their staff. Acquiring sufficient funding for regional conservation efforts is an opportunity to invest in conservation, economic development, and human welfare in tribal communities. The purpose of this initiative is to increase long-term stable funding for tribal-led natural resource stewardship so that people, wildlife, and the land of the Northern Great Plains can continue to help one another. There are 40 participants from 13 Native nations. Uh, in 2019, uh, we brought on a full-time coordinator, and in 2020, they've completed two major pieces of work. Uh, the first is they've developed a regional conservation plan with a vision, mission, goals, and some very specific um, action items. Um, and you can see this is very much in line with, with everything that this roadmap um, seeks to achieve. Native nations unite to ensure the diversity of life in the Northern Great Plains flourishes for current and future generations. And I'll let you read through this, but it's... Um, it's a, it's a very exciting and high level regional effort combining the efforts of many different native nations. The second one is they um, had a consultant who has engaged, had been engaged in many of the examples of conservation trust funds provided on this slide. Um, recently completed a feasibility study to determine whether a conservation trust fund would be an approach that would be even feasible in this context. And the conclusion after interviewing over 60 different people from a variety of um, perspectives is that it is feasible. So the Sustainable Financing Initiative formally voted to pursue the next steps towards developing such a fund. And um, so a big, a big effort moving forward. The last um, of the three collaborations that I want to touch on with you all is a, um, an effort that is very nascent. It started about six months ago with a small group of stakeholders from different sectors, from academia, from ranching, from conservation NGOs, from some companies in the beef supply chain to explore what collective action could look like. Very similar and parallel to what this roadmap is looking to do. Um, the question we asked was, could we develop a pathway that would inspire new commitments at a scale that would be meaningful to address the challenges the ecosystem and the people face? We agreed that we would develop a problem statement, a shared vision, and a set of ambitious, specific, and grounded goals. Um, there's a draft document of that problem statement and very much a draft stage that we provided um, to this effort, it's on the resources page on the website for the roadmap. The, um, and here is a very, again, very draft stage, um, but we felt important to put together a set of high level goals. Um, so by 2030, the Great Plains are known worldwide for establishing a culture of resilient abundance for people and nature as a place where people work for the land and the land works for the people, where wildlife thrives as it has for eons and where people come to build a bright future. And we're developing these, these need further development, um, but high level and specific goals for the next decade to maintain, current, maintain the current extent of grasslands, to improve the condition of the existing grasslands, to invigorate or boost the communities and grass-based economy, and to enhance the sustainability of row crop lands where they exist. Um, I think what's unique about this is um, in addition to developing these science-based goals, which again need further development to get more specific and clear, um, the devil's always in the details, we recognize that, um, but the group agreed that when I use the, ter the term grounded that um, they envision really flipping on its head the approach of setting goals in a top-down approach and wanted to um, develop a straw dog, develop a, something to, to respond to, 
but then take these two communities, take these two ranching communities when work with indigenous communities to, um, to further develop them together and to agree on a set of goals for the next decade that we can all work on. Um, that would then um, be finalized and then in some way go public to attract engagement by the actors we need to achieve scale. So our question is, and, and, this, and, and I was really appreciative of the opportunity to talk to you about this in this panel um, as part of this roadmap effort, is can we integrate these two efforts? Um, could the goals that this group has started to develop be further developed by this effort? And could it potentially offer a destination for this roadmap and, and, and the two efforts coalesce? So as we move into the work, working group sessions, we offer this um, as, as something potential to chew on. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this panel and look forward to being part of developing the roadmap going forward. Great, thanks, Ellison. It's always, always good to follow Martha. Um, look, we have a big opportunity right now. And you know, we're in a position nationally that you know, we're gonna end up spending trillions of dollars in the next you know, six to 12 months um, to try to figure out how to rebuild the economy, um, figure out ways to improve resilience, um, and hopefully you know, get back on track in the aftermath of the pandemic. And the opportunities for significant funding for grassland conservation have probably never been higher if we can kind of get, align the, the various pieces and kind of get our act together. Um, like I don't need to tell anybody on this call about the imperiled nature of the, the resource and the you know, globally significance of the, of the ecosystem. But last year when the State of the Birds report came out, there were two numbers that kind of leaped off the page. One was the, I mean, there are three numbers. The first number is you know, being down 29% overall and you know, the 3, million, 3 billion birds fewer than 1970. But the two numbers that, that, that kind of stuck out for me was the 53% decline in grassland birds and the 56% increase in waterfowl. And you start thinking about, well, why, why is that? And what's the, what's the, what, what are the policy mechanisms? Outside of, kind of some economic forces and, you know, and our insatiable de demand for additional ethanol and you know, all the things we do to incentivize folks to plow, plow up grasslands. And I think one of the biggest differences has been significant dedicated funding. You know, going back to the, going back to the duck stamp, um, going back to the creation of NACA 30 years ago, wetland conservation in this country has had multiple programs of dedicated funding year after year that groups like mine and Ducks Unlimited and, and so many of you um, can leverage and the Nature Conservancy and so many others can leverage to do amazing conservation work for wetlands. And like, it's not nearly enough. And we've lost 30 years of having a lack of Clean Water Act protections given court cases and the insanity of the fights over the clean water rule. But there have been more tools available. And, you know, outside of CRP, which is, a, you know, it's an incredibly important program. And you know, the amazing work that you know, I'm, I'm so proud of my team, folks like Aviva Glazer and, and Julie Sibbing and Lake Knopfman um, that have done on things like the, the Sod Saver program, you know, which is in you know, six states now and needs to go nationwide, the Swamp Buster program. Um, we have fewer tools um, to conserve and restore our, our grasslands than most other types. Um, some of that has to do with regional power um, and you know, not necessarily being battleground states. Some of it is having amazing scientists working on it, but not enough advocacy. And I'll take part of the blame for that because I don't think the National Wildlife Federation um, has done enough in, in um, over generations to make sure there was more equitable funding for grassland conservation. Um, but frankly, you know, we're at a point now where given the rates of loss that we've seen, um, given the importance of the ecosystem and given the increased awareness of the importance, not just for habitat, and I, know I can talk about, you know, bubble lengths and, you know, kind of in Western, um, and 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 metal western metal arcs and so on. I'm you know blue in the face, but I think folks are finally realizing from a climate you know point of view, both for resilience. Um, you know the places in Nebraska that had much healthier grasslands along the Missouri it fared much better during the during the flooding last year than places without. Um, from the carbon sequestration value, which are absolutely astronomic, and then just from the economic kind of lens of keeping working lands working and keeping ranching um, economical in this country that there's more and more chance for intersectional partnerships than ever before. And so there's a couple of things we have to do, um, you know, of course, 
as part of a bigger strategy. And a lot of it are the pieces that have been laid out in the different segments. But I, I do think, and the reason I wanted to join you all today, you know, in person or <laughs> virtually, I guess, um, was I think this needs to be a much higher national priority. Folks running grassland programs and conservation organizations have doing amazing things. I mean, I think about the leadership that Marshall's providing. I mean, it's absolutely spectacular. And how do you think about the work that TNC has been doing for years, the work that WWF's been doing, the, the private sector kind of intersections are, are fantastic. But if you if you ask the average you know, conservation group where grasslands rank, it doesn't usually wind up in the top couple priorities. Maybe that's because it hasn't been wedged enough into the climate conversation. Maybe that's you know, as folks have you know, moved towards emission reduction, it's, you know, kind of, it seems more of a natural solution as opposed to, you know, the clean energy solutions. But we need to make this a national priority and we need to break through. And we need to make sure that more folks than just, you know, all of us on this, on this webinar or folks that get together and, you know, the great conferences that we help put on with many of you um, are aware of this. And, and now is the time, right? Because there, there's a moment right now where folks are, are, are willing to think about things a little differently. We're likely gonna have some changes in governance, God willing. Um, and it's in you know some of the halls of power in Washington, and it's in that in that change right that creates significant opportunity. And so I just wanted to lay out a couple you know places where I'd love to work together. And I know some of you can are allowed to do kind of advocacy work. Some of you maybe aren't as much, um, but I think there's a role for everybody because frankly, elevating the profile of the needs and the solutions for grasslands, whether those are market-based solutions or investment solutions or even some regulatory ones. Um, they just need to have a higher profile and they need to have much more, much more visibility um, by, by elected officials and government officials across the country. And so, I mean, uh, you can't talk about grassland policy without starting with the farm bill. Um, and, and of course, you know, we made some pretty good strides last round. You know, we're still dealing with the insanity of this administration's kind of war on CRP and inability to implement that program. And I think they're trying to reduce the baseline and we're trying to you know, wage that, you know, wage that fight right now, trying to get the program back on track. Um, but the, you know, the making sure the environmental the equip programs are, are kind of going out quickly and, and well designed and better and better designed. And then I talked about Todd Saver and Swamp Foster and some of the incentives or at least disincentives that we can, that we can get into place. Um, we've talked a little bit um, about the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. This is one of my, my personal, personal kind of priorities. Um, right now, one of the best ways to restore our grasslands is to help sure that, make, make sure that state wildlife agencies have enough resources to implement their state wildlife action plans. And you know, you think in that state like North Dakota, where Terry, the, the state director, you know, has, a, has a great state wildlife action plan. They get you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to try to implement. It's a fraction of what they need. Um, you know, and he would like nothing more to do a lot more bird grassland conservation um, to both bring back the species, but also avoid the potential listings. I mean, the number of listings in the Dakotas alone, um, if we don't get ahead of, um, if we don't kind of restore habitat and get ahead of some of the declines um, could just be massive and cause all kinds of battles in the years ahead, which we could really avoid by investing a little further upstream. And that's what the Re Recovering America's Wildlife Act does. It funds the proactive collaborative conservation of the state through the state wildlife action plan and through the territorial action plans and, and, and gives and proposes $97 million a year for the tribes as well. But every state would get between $11 million and $57 million a year. Um, they also get additional incentives um, for having more native plants as a way to bring back Kind of the full biodiversity in this country but the idea would be to try to conserve the full diversity of wildlife and you can't you know do that in any kind of meaningful way without having grassland conservation being front and center in those efforts um, there's climate bills that are significant um, if you haven't had a chance to read the select committee the house select committee on the climate crisis is report um, the word grasslands is mentioned 50 times in the document I actually did a keyword search to, to check that on page 444 there's an entire section on grassland and forest conservation as climate solutions for both resilience and mitigation. Um, but a lot of the ideas there are a little less baked. I mean, there's ideas pulling from some work that Deb Holland and some others have been doing and, and, and Derek Kilmer. And, but for the most part, these are ideas that frankly need a little more flesh on the bones. But the fact that we have kind of an in there creates an opportunity to reach a whole nother set of you know, legislators and folks outside of the, the plains to care about these issues. Um, maybe from more of an admission point of view than a, than a habitat point of view, but I'll take, I'll take all the allies that, that we can get. Um, you know, we need to start thinking about the next farm bill. Um, it's only a few years away, which is terrifying for those of us that work on it. Um, but yeah, but like I said before, making this thought safer a national program, um, you know, doing more to kind of maybe doing more to, um, to make sure there's more resources available for, for grassland, not just conservation, but also restoration um, and really making the economics even more favorable. And then looking ahead, um, there, I think there are some significant opportunities. And one of the ideas that we want to pitch to all of you today that I know Viva Glazer from our team has been talking to many of you about 
is this idea of actually creating a North American Grasslands Conservation Act that would you know, look a lot like NACA um, in, in many ways. It would have a, create a national strategy, um, really tying together the different pieces that are, are out there right now across the agency, but not necessarily coordinated. Um, it probably dedicated funding for conservation and restoration and management of, of grasslands. Um, we could leverage that a million different ways. I mean, just working with pheasants forever alone, we can leverage a lot of that money. Um, encourage the, the, the U.S. government to do more um, it, with the, the trilateral, um, working with Canada and with Mexico, um, and thinking of more systematically across. There's some great work going on at USDA and some other pockets, but it's not as coordinated as it could be across agencies. Um, really having you know, more dedicated resources for education and outreach, making sure that this is a, um, a, a better understood uh, resource that is um, you know, treasured and, and, and cared for by, by more, more Americans. And then having the agencies work together on monitoring and mapping and some of the technical assistance. And frankly, a lot of this is going to leverage work that's been done by many of the groups on this, on this call, but really having a national strategy. And look, I don't want to pretend like the no net loss, you know, um, executive order by President H George H.W. Bush was kind of the panacea for all the wetland challenges. We've obviously lost more since then, but it was a focusing mechanism. And it did allow you know, more interagency collaboration. And you know, we should be shooting for a net gain, right? We should be trying to increase the amount of, of grassland um, acreage in the country and not just kind of slow the, the, the slow demise of, the, of this great resource. We have another huge opportunity. One of the reasons I look so haggard right now is I've been killing myself the last few weeks trying to run up the score on the Great American Outdoors Act, which passed yesterday, which includes $900 million of funding every year in perpetuity for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Now, traditionally, a lot of the stateside money, and for that matter, a lot of the federal money, has gone more to the parks. Um, but there are huge opportunities for grassland conservation. I mean, there is a piece that's gone to the Fish and Wildlife Service for easements. Um, and, and, and frankly, thinking about how we use that money to advance some of the strategies in the Dakota grasslands conservation area, um, thinking about other you know, major landscapes and trying to have those be areas where both, both the federal side and the state side dollars are prioritized, um, creates all kinds of new opportunities to accelerate conservation work, which may have taken decades before to try to scrape together the individual pieces. And now all of a sudden, you know, it might be able to get done in just, just a year or two. Um, so again, big opportunities and new tools. And like I said, that's $900 million every year in perpetuity that we can leverage you know, a million different ways. And so here's why I need your help. I think, and, this is, and this isn't a criticism, but we need to get the word out, right? We need to figure out ways to elevate the profile. You know. I don't want anyone to get political. This is a C3 conversation, but there's an election going on. Minnesota is pretty important. Having folks that happen to write things that wind up in the Minneapolis Star Tribune that would happen to be seen by you know, many folks that are seeking votes right now is a way to raise the profile, right? I mean, there's different things that we all can do. If you have a chance to talk to your member of Congress, be talking about the importance of grassland conservation, particularly funding. Talk about the, the role that grassland conservation can play to make communities safer, that can help clean up water, help reduce emissions, keep working lands working. And at the same time, create a ton of jobs, right? And we know that investments in grassland conservation can create up to 30 jobs for every million dollars we spend. It's one of the highest returns on investment because it's so labor intensive and doesn't have as much equipment and materials compared to a lot of other types of infrastructure. These are big ideas, right? These are the conversations that can hopefully put us into the national conversation. So when they're talking about trillions of dollars of funding, we're actually really at the table. And so I would love to work with all of you. Uh, and our team is already kind of fully integrated in this kind of bold new national grasslands policy. I do think there's a chance to make it a presidential priority and that's not just because I'm talking to you right now from the great state of Delaware and I'm a little partial, but I think we're, look we're looking for input on some of these national legislative pieces because I think if we can combine these amazing on the ground projects that you've just heard a series of that are absolutely amazing with sustained dedicated funding and federal policy support, then we're off to the races. We won't just be talking about slowing the bleeding. We'll be talking about how do we really stand up our grasslands to be the incredible ecological powerhouse and economic engine that I think we all know they can be. That's the potential. And I really encourage each of you to, uh, to lean in and think big, think bold, but really try to seize this moment because out of this crisis, God, this is cliche, but out of this, out of this moment, there is, lies incredible opportunity. And I just think if we don't figure a way to seize it right now, it might be an opportunity that doesn't come back immediately. So let's make grasslands an absolute top priority for this country in 2021 and beyond. Thank you very much for having me today.